Okay, I'm going to fast forward a bit through the history of Israel. We have covered up to the time of Solomon and how under his son Rehoboam, the southern kingdom of Judah was divided from the northern kingdom of Israel. Here we see the chronology of the kings of Israel and Judah. The green side is the kings of Judah, while the red side is the kings of Israel. So you see at the very top, there's Saul and David and Solomon, which were the kings over the entire kingdom of Israel. And then under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the kingdom was split into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And then it um, goes down through the line of kings. The entire northern kingdom of Israel eventually is referred to as Ephraim because Ephraim was the prominent tribe and was in direct competition with the temple in Jerusalem. Remember Jeroboam set up the golden calves in Dan and in Bethel to compete with Solomon's temple and to prevent the people of the northern kingdom from going there. The earlier prophecy against Jeroboam came to pass. A man from Naphtali named Basha killed Jeroboam's entire family. Basha also did not do any better, and a man named Elah killed his entire family. Zimri killed his family, and Omri was his general, who led a revolution against him, and Omri became king. Omri built the city of Samaria as his capital. And you see Samaria on the map there in Manasseh. It is just north of Shechem. Now the son of Omri was Ahab. Ahab married the daughter of the Phoenician king of Sidon. Her name was Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel set up a temple to Baal in Samaria and enforced the Baal religion of Jezebel upon the entire kingdom of Israel, the entire northern kingdom. This is when God raised up the prophet Elijah against Ahab and Jezebel. This is about 875 to 850 B.C. In episode 15, part 2, when we looked at the Edomites, we talked about Ahab and Jehoshaphat, how they became allies and started naming their children after each other. The fall of Jezebel is important to understand for us because we want to pay attention to Jezreel. Jezreel is a city to the north in Ishakar. Ahab and Jezebel had a second palace there. And Ahab saw a vineyard he liked in Jezreel that was next to his palace, but it belonged to Naboth, a man of Jezreel. He asked Naboth to sell him the vineyard, but Naboth told Ahab he cannot sell his inheritance to him. It was family land. You can't sell family land like that. Ahab became very sad because he couldn't buy the vineyard. And when Jezebel find out why he was sad, she said, I will get the vineyard for you. So she called the elders of the town and told them to proclaim a fast to Yahweh and put Naboth at the front of the people and get two men of Belial to falsely accuse him of blasphemy against God and against the king. So they did it, and Naboth was taken out and killed for blasphemy. They stoned him to death. Jezebel then got word back that it had been done, and she went and told Ahab, Go and claim your vineyard, because Naboth is dead. Ahab became happy, and he was on his way to the vineyard. But God sent Elijah to meet him. And I'll just read the confrontation between them. It speaks for itself. 1 Kings chapter 21 starting at verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. 
Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak to him, saying, Thus says Yahweh, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus says Yahweh, In the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of Yahweh. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisses against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spoke Yahweh, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dies of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat, and him that dies in the field, the fowls of the air shall eat. End quote. Ahab ended up fasting and repenting. So God said, I will not bring it in his days. I will bring it on his son. At that time, after the prophet Elijah beat the 450 prophets of Baal, who ate at Jezebel's table in the contest on Mount Carmel, you'll find that in 1 Kings chapter 18, where uh, he challenged them to a sacrifice contest, where they piled up all the wood and the, the meat of the offering, and they danced around it and chanted around it, and but nothing happened. And then Elijah piled up his wood and his offering. He had them soak it down with water, and then he called upon Yahweh, and the fire came down and, and uh, devoured the entire thing. And uh, so then he won, and he uh, had the 450 prophets of Baal uh, put to death for being felt false prophets. And he won the hearts of the people back for Yahweh. Um, uh, now at that time, Elijah was threatened by Jezebel. She said, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. And Elijah became afraid and he ran away and he ran to a cave near Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were given. And uh, that's the, uh, you may have heard of the still small voice in the wind that spoke to Elijah. Uh, that, that's happened at that cave. You'll find that in 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 11. Uh, he received a prophecy there, and God told him to anoint Jehu, the army captain, as king of Israel. And Jehu ended up carrying out Elijah's prophecies against Ahab and Jezebel. Now Jehu was anointed king by Elijah, and he revolted with his men. They besieged Ahab's son, Jehoram in the city of Jezreel. He also killed Ahaziah, the king of Judah, because he was there vi visiting Jeroboam at that time. Jezebel had locked herself in the tower at Jezreel. The tower is the stronghold of the city. The eunuchs in the tower called out the window to Jehu, What do you want? And he said, Throw her down. So they threw Jezebel out of the window of the tower, and Jehu trampled her with his horse. He then went in to eat with the eunuchs, and the dogs tore Jezebel up and ate her. Jehu then murdered the entire bloodline of Ahab. He also pretended to call a great sacrifice to Baal in the temple of Baal, 
And when the worshippers of Baal had gathered in the temple, he had the doors shut, and he slaughtered every one of them. Jehu eradicated Baal worship from the northern kingdom of Israel, but he didn't take down the two golden calves that Jeroboam had set up. God said to Jehu, Because you have followed my instructions perfectly, your children will sit on the throne of Israel for four generations. But Jehu never took it to heart to follow God after that, and he never departed from the sins of Jeroboam. It was under the king of Israel in Samaria, named Jeroboam II, which is the fourth generation from Jehu. Um, now, Jeroboam II, when he became king of Israel, this was at the height of the northern kingdom's power. They had defeated Damascus. They had grain, gained a great amount of territory, and they were... Um, referred to as drunkards and lazy. They, they were so rich and they had no problems. Their kingdom was so powerful that they just spent most of their time in the palace drinking and partying and carousing. And this brought about uh, the, the downfall. Now, Jeroboam II... He was either the third or the fourth generation, actually, from Jehu. Because there's Jehu, then Jehoaz, then Jehoash, then Jeroboam the second, and then Zechariah. You see in the list of the kings of Israel, Zechariah was the son of Jeroboam the second. Uh, he was on the throne for about... Uh, just a few months. And then his captain, Shalom, the captain of his army, overthrew him and killed him. And then the captain of Shalom's army overthrew him, and that's Menahem. And then his son, Pekiah, ruled for about two years. And then the captain of his army, named Pekah, overthrew him. And then Hoshea, the captain of Pekah's army, assassinated him. Um, now, as far as Hosea, the prophet, is concerned, it ended with Jeroboam. Because he, he doesn't list the son of Jeroboam. During the rule of Jeroboam II was when God began to send prophets. Uh, this is... Some of the first of the Old Testament prophets start to come around this time. Um, he sent the prophet Joel. Joel is a, a very short prophet, a short, short uh, book, and it's very heavy duty. It, it's, uh, it's about the great day of the Lord, and it's uh, also about the great day of judgment. And... He also sent the prophet Amos. Amos um, is also a minor prophet, meaning that the book is not a very big book. It's only three or four pages, but it goes through prophecies against mostly the surrounding nations and then towards Israel and Judah. And all the prophets refer to a coming time of restoration and and mercy from God. And we're going to take a, a, a detailed look at Hosea because Hosea really links Ephraim to Israel. And it's also a, a very cool prophecy, which you'll see. Um, now, Hosea was also contemporary with the major prophet Isaiah. Now, they call Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah major prophets because they are rather large books. The book of Isaiah is 66 chapters. So Isaiah, he was a prophet in Judah, 
during the time of four kings in Judah, uh, beginning with Uzziah, then Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And after and and just before the destruction of Jerusalem, down further would be the time when Jeremiah was the prophet because he actually lived through the destruction of Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem. Uh, under the siege, he was the prophet in, in the city. But today we're more concerned with Israel right now. And we've learned a little bit about Jehu, who Jehu was. Now, let's uh, first begin by reading the first chapter of Hosea. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Biri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And that's his timeline. So he doesn't mention Jeroboam's son, Zechariah even though he mentions the four kings of Judah, which are the exact same four kings Isaiah mentions, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. But the interesting thing here is that Israel was taken away captive into Assyria, the lost ten tribes, during the reign of Ahaz. So Hosea continued to prophesy even past the time of the Assyrian captivity. It, it, he doesn't talk much about the history, it's pure prophecy. We can only assume where was he? Was, did he go to Jerusalem before the Assyrians invaded? Or did he merely survive the invasion and stay in the northern kingdom? Um, I talked before about how Assyria would transplant people and when they took away the ten tribes of Israel into captivity, they put other people in that land. And that is where the Samaritans came from. Um, people who have studied the New Testament, like Jesus, when he gives the, the, the parable of the good Samaritan, and when he talked to the lady at the well, the Samaritan lady, they are... The Samaritans are the people that the Assyrians put in that land. They were not Israelites. But what happened was when the Assyrians put them in there, they asked about the God of that land. Because in those times, every land had a God associated with it. So the Samaritans were taken, were, were put into the land of Israel, the northern kingdom, and they inquired, uh, who's the God of this land? And, it, and somehow they learned that the God of the land was Yahweh, and they learned of Yahweh, and they ended up setting up a separate temple on Mount Gerizim, and that becomes a, a new part of history that we'll talk about later. So maybe Hosea was the one teaching them about Yahweh. I, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, that's the way it happened. So let's read the first chapter of Hosea and get into this prophecy a little bit. And it's pretty exciting, this one. So after he talks about the king, starting in verse 2, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and the children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said to him, Call her name lo Ruhamah, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. 
but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and I will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned Lohruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then said God, Call his name lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be me measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So this is a very interesting prophecy, and we just learned a lot about Jehu and Jezreel. Now, the first thing to look at is um, whoredom. Uh, I'll take a wife of whoredom. And the, because the land has committed great whoredoms by leaving their God. Um, whoredom is an old English word. This is the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, a, a more accurate modern word would be adultery. And there was two ways of understanding this word adultery in the Hebrew language. Um, Adultery was like a wife committing adultery against her husband, but it was also God's people committing adultery by worshiping other gods. And it's the exact same word that can also be translated idolatry. So idolatry is adultery. In the King James Version, it's often whoredom. So, yes, a husband could also commit adultery, but this, is a, this prophecy is geared towards God's people committing idolatry because that was the sin of Jeroboam I, the golden calves. So he's telling him, take a wife of adultery and make children with her. And then uh, he named the name of the wife is Gomer, which is interesting. Gomer, in episode 7, we covered the uh, table of the nations in Genesis chapter 10. And that's where the three children of Noah um, populated the earth. The three children of Noah are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now Shem, that's where we get the word Semite. And the Israelites were Semite. Um, Ham was more in the south in Egypt and Arabia, or Ham. And Japheth was Greece and Europe, basically. Um, and the Anatolian Peninsula also was uh, populated by Japheth people. So Gomer was the firstborn son of Japheth, and they are basically the Indo-European people. And calling her the name Gomer was like a great insult towards the northern kingdom of Israel because they were very proud of themselves. They were like, well, we're Ephraim. Um, we're the, the great, wonderful Ephraim that Jacob spoke of. We're God's people. Nobody can touch us. Even though they were worshiping other gods, they had this attitude. So this was like a, a great a insult towards them, saying, you are the sons of Gomer. Your mother is Gomer. Okay? So then... He, she uh, produces a son, and God says, call his name Jezreel. Now, Jezreel, Kegomer, means completion. 
Jezreel means to sow. And it also means to scatter. Like when you're sowing seeds, you're scattering the seeds. So it's God will sow or God will scatter. So now God is saying, call his name Jezreel because I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. Now, there's a theological debate about this. Now, if we remember when uh, God commissioned Jehu to wipe out the whole family of Ahab and the uh, and Jezebel, and he did it. He did it. Actually, it was a great massacre in Jezreel. It was the whole family of Ahab and Jezebel. And then after he was finished doing it, God said to him, 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 30, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in my eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So the theological debate is that God was very pleased with what he did in that time. And now he's saying, I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. So... Well, why, if God was so pleased, why is he avenging the blood now? And it's very easy to explain. If you look at this chart here, this is a chart that I made of Hosea chapter 1. And here's uh, the wife Gomer at the top, and then the three sons that were born, and what was said about each one of them. And if you look at it in general... Um, what is it all about? Uh, okay, the first son, Jezreel, is born. I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu. I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then the daughter is born, Loruhama, which means not pitied. And he says, I will ha no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. I will utterly take them away. I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by Yahweh their God. I will not save them by bow or sword or battle or horses or horsemen. And then after Loruhamah was weaned, the third son named or the second son, the third child, named Lo-Ami, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. The number of the children of Israel, okay, for you are not, now he's speaking to Israel again, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. But the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. And Judah and Israel shall be gathered together under one head, one ruler, and they will come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So what's this prophecy about? This prophecy is about the utter destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel while the kingdom of Judah will be saved. And later on, the bringing in of a new Israel. So... How does that work? What's that got to do with the blood of Jezreel? Is what I'm saying, okay? Now I'll explain this to you. If you look at the 
this uh, chart again about the kings. On the left is the kings of Israel, and then the green on the right is the kings of Judah. And we're going to focus a little bit about Ahab and Jezebel. Now, if we remember Ahab and Jezebel, they uh, were wonderful friends with Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a king of Judah, and he uh, had the temple worship and followed the religion of Yahweh very closely. And they were great friends. They were great allies, Ahab and Jezebel with Jehoshaphat. And they named their children after each other. Now, Ahab and Jezebel had two sons, the one named ah Ahaziah and the other one named Jehoram. And the son of Jehoshaphat was named Jehoram. And the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel was named Athaliah, and she married Jehoram. And their son was named Ahaziah. That was the king of Judah. So he carried the same name as the son of Ahab and Jezebel, Ahaziah. Now, the son of Jezebel and Ahab was Ahaziah. That was the firstborn son. And then when he died, the secondborn son, who was named Jehoram, he became the king. That's that arrow going across. It's going from the firstborn to the secondborn. And then Jehoram was overthrown by Jehu. Okay, now Jehu, when he destroyed the entire family of Ahab and Jezebel, remember when he came to Jezreel, and what he did was, uh, that, that was their second palace, and their first palace was in Shechem. So Jehu sent a message to Shechem, and he said, you kill all the sons of Ahab. And if you don't, then I'm coming down there to do it. And the people of Shechem uh, decided that they better work with Jehu. So they beheaded the seven, 70 sons of Ahab and they sent the heads in baskets up to Jezreel to Jehu. And Jehu piled the 70 heads outside the city and to convince the people of the city he to say it's not only me doing this everybody's doing this and so now i'm uh, uh, hand over the ahab and jezebel and their whole family and that got the cooperation of the people of jezreel to cooperate with jehu and that's where Jezebel was thrown out of the tower and trampled by Jehu's horse, and the dogs ate her. And when Jehu was coming to the city, Ahab was in the city, and he was recovering from a wound that he received while he was at war against Damascus. He got wounded in battle, and he went to Jezreel to recover. And the king of Judah, Ahaziah, went to visit Ahab. You see, Ahab was his grandfather. Ahab and Jezebel were his grandfather and grandmother through his mother's side, through Athaliah. You see? So, or Athaliah. So Jehoram, the king of Judah, had died, and Ahaziah had become king. He was a young king, and his mother was still alive, and her name was Athaliah. So he went to visit his grandfather in Jezreel. Now when Jehu came to attack Jezreel, Ahaziah went out with Ahab to meet Jehu. And Jehu killed Ahab, and then he had him thrown into the field of Nabob, the one that they stole his vineyard by killing him. 
and according to the prophecy of God, so that Je uh, Jezebel was eaten by the dogs, and Ahab was eaten by the birds in the field. And then Jehu sent his men after Ahaziah, the king of Judah, and they wounded him, and he fled to Megiddo, where he died. So Jehu actually had Ahaziah killed, who was the grandson of Ahab and Jezebel. Now the mistake that he made was that Ahaziah was not of the house of Ahab. Ahaziah was the, the house of David. He was the son of Jehoram. He was the king of Judah of the house of David. And, when, and now I'll explain these little arrows here. When Ahaziah died, his mother became the queen, uh, Athaliah. And what she did was she turned around and murdered the entire family of Jehoram. All, um, he, he had sons with other wives and things, and she had the entire ro royal family murdered. But the younger son, Jehoash, hid and lived. And then when Jehoash, she ruled for, I think, 10 years. And then when Jehoash was a little older, then he overthrew her and, and had her killed. So, so she was the um, daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So because of Jehu, the entire royal family of David, except for Jehoash, was wiped out. Because he killed Ahaziah, the son of Athaliah, Athaliah, and she wiped out the royal family, and Jehoash wiped her out. So this was the God is avenging this. This is the blood of Jez, Jezreel that God is talking about, the blood of. Ahaziah, because he almost wiped out the uh, line of David. See, so if you look at, back again at the, the Hosea prophecy, it's all about Israel is gone, but Judah will be saved. He's, he's reversing, this is his avengement. He's reversing what they did to the house of David. So he says, I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. That's it. I will do exactly to Israel what they almost did to David. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel. The bow is the strength, the, the military strength. In the valley of Jezreel. And that is... Um, because of this prophecy, we assume that um, it was in the Valley of Jezreel where the first great battle took place between the Assyrians and the Northern Kingdom and where um, they were broken. And there was um, actually two battles. In the first battle, the Assyrian king put a king in in, in uh, I'm not sure, but he put a king in the throne. And then he came back, and, and, and that, that king rebelled against Assyria, and then he came back and took them all away and brought the other people in. Um, so anyway, so now the daughter is born, Loruhama, which means not pitied. And he says, I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. I have no pity on them. I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by Yahweh their God. I will not save them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. And then, after Loruhamah Lo was weaned, then the next son, Loami, was born. So what does he mean by weaned? Uh, what does that mean prophetically or spiritually? Well, if we look at 
New Testament, book of Hebrews. New Testament, book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 12 to 14. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In Christianity, when someone first becomes saved, they're known as baby, a baby. And they are fed milk. It's it's the milk like um, you are saved by faith in Jesus, and you are made righteous by the faith of Jesus. And through baptism, all your sins are washed away. This is like milk. But after you become a mature Christian, God leads you on a journey through the Holy Spirit, and you get to discern between good and evil. And you are also expected to act on that discernment and to not do evil. And, to, and your life changes as you learn and you adapt new principles. You, you uh, become a follower of God's ways and that is considered the meat, the uh, growing up in faith. So, so who is Lo Ruhama? Well, if you look at what he's talking about here, is he's talking about the new Israel. And the new Israel that's coming, Lo Ami, is the Christian Israel. So Lo Ruhama is all about saving the house of Judah. Now, when Jesus first was born and came into the world, he preached to the Jews first. All of the first Christians were Jews. All of the apostles, the first apostles were Jews. Peter, Paul, um, James, John, they were all Jews who followed Christ. And then, after a, 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 a little bit of time, then the gospel went out to the Gentiles, but it began with the Jews. So this was the weaning of Lo Ruhama, is, um, the, or, the, or the time of Lo Ruhama, is when, the, uh, when she is weaned, then the new people are called. So the third part, is lo ami, not my people. That's the Gentiles. Because these are the sons of Gomer. You see how Gomer is tied into the Gentiles? For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Because the ten tribes are scattered among the Indo-Europeans by this time. The number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there it shall be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. So if you look at a New Testament map of the area of Jezreel, it's Galilee. You see the northern um, lake there in Israel, that lake is the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus preached, all around the Sea of Galilee. So Jezreel is actually in Galilee. So in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there it shall be said to them, You are the sons of the living God. And there the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together. So there's the Jewish Christians, and the Gentile Christians. And they are gathered together. They are both Christians. 
and they are gathered together under one head, Jesus Christ. And they shall appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. And they shall come up out of the land. Well, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So they really had no claims to any land. They were, their only claim was to Christ. And during that time, um, the Jewish church, which did not accept Christ, only some of them did, the ones who did not persecuted the Christians. They saw them as a cult, uh, a threat to their synagogue, and they tried to eradicate them. Um, now this does not mean the Jews of today are God's enemies. Um, God still, there's still a lot of prophecies about Judah, and God still has a plan for those people. So be careful how you judge, um, especially when it comes to judging the Jews. Uh, I will always say that whenever we talk about these things, because in history, Christians have become anti-Semite, thinking, well, you killed Jesus, you know. Um, actually, no. If you think you're saved by the blood of Jesus, you killed Jesus. You think about it that way. And uh, the Jews are still are God's people. They're, uh, they're playing a role in this whole play, this whole scenario of life and history. And God still is very much interested in the Jews. So that is basically the first chapter of Hosea, which is extremely interesting. It's, it's the taking away of the northern kingdom to become the lost ten tribes. And then the salvation of the Jews which was the early Christianity, was all Jews, and then the gospel going to the Gentiles. Now in the second chapter, it kind of carries on with this narrative. The second chapter of Hosea. Say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhama. Now you notice there's a change in their names. Lo, Ruhama which means not pitied, has now become Ruhama, which means pitied. And lo ami, which means not my people, has become ami, which means my people. So now the, the Jews are pitied, and the new Christians are my people. You see? Say to your brothers, ami, and to your sisters, Ruhama, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother has played the harlot, she has conceived them. She that conceived them has done shamefully. So who's the mother of these children? It's the church, the mother of the Jews and the mother of the Christians is their church is the the Jewish church has become the synagogue system and the Christian church eventually became the Roman church in in the third century or even they claim it to be right from Peter so yeah the mother okay and it and and this is this is the way prophecy You've heard uh, history repeats itself. Prophecy repeats itself too. 
So Ephraim was all proud. Oh, all the things that God said about Ephraim. We're Ephraim. God said this about us. God said we're so great. We're wonderful. Um, they become very proud of themselves. And Christians can be the same way. They're like, oh, well, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. Uh, and God said all these wonderful promises to me. And it has nothing to do with what I actually do. That they argue about whether you can lose your salvation or not. Well, it's a lot more um, complicated than that. And the church, I, I speak of the church as an entity itself. The people in the church, you'll find in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, it speaks about Babylon the Great, and it says, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. Um, so it's like they are God's people, but they're in this awful system. They are supporting it. And if you're supporting it, then you are part of it. And you are responsible for what you are supporting. In the Revelation, there's also a Jezebel that teaches God's people to eat things sacrificed to idols. She brings Baal worship into God's people. And she replaces God's church with Baal worship. And that is exactly what has happened. So if when you read this, it's talking about the ancient northern kingdom and warning them they could have turned things around, but they didn't. But then you're also looking at Christianity. It's not like, oh, I, was a, I became a Christian once, and so now I'm saved whether I like it or not. It's people leave the church. They, they, they um, n reject it. They, they reject Christ. They, uh, people enter into a church that does not necessarily teach Christ. So they never really knew Christ. There's a lot of bad things going on. It's just like in northern kingdom of Israel. They had the Baal worship and the golden calves. These people were not learning about God. It's actually Hosea that says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. So you have to have the milk and then the meat and grow in your life to be God's people. It doesn't, it's not just because someone said so, it's because of who you become and who you are. Um, so I'll carry on with this. Where was I? For their mother has played the harlot. She that conceived them has done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give me bread and my water, my wool, my flax, my oil, and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Therefore I will return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and, re and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Remember in the book of Re Revelation, um, pray that you are not found naked. When it talks about the great, day, the great day of judgment, the taking away of the northern kingdom of Israel is a forerunner of the great day of judgment. Okay, 
Now I will discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. This is directly talking about a church. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the fields shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Berlin, where she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgot me, said the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably to her. And I will give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, says the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shall not call me no more Bali. Ishi means a man. A man. You shall call me a man in that day. I suppose he's talking about the day of Jezreel. You shall no more call me Baal. You shall call me a man. For I will take away the names of Baalim out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee to me forever, yea, I will betroth thee to me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. I will even betroth thee to me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. For it shall come to pass in that day, now the, there's two days he's talking about. Um, there's two comings of Christ. There's two destructions of Israel. There's two of everything. Okay? And it shall come, pa come to pass in that day that I will hear, says the Lord, and I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that has not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. This is also talking about Jesus Christ and Christianity the day of Jezreel. And then there's a new lover. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, and yet an adulteress. Now this is after those three children that we looked at, after Christianity. Then said the Lord to me, Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half homer of barley. And I said to her, Thou shalt abide with me for many days and thou shalt not play the harlot and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. And afterward shall the children of Israel return, and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. See, so this is all about destruction of Israel and the coming of Christ. 
but it's also about the judgment day and the second coming of Christ. Um, now we're going to, he goes on a lot here about Israel and their sins. When chapter 5 is uh, where he really starts to tie in Ephraim with Israel. So hear ye this, O priests, and hearken, you house of Israel, and give ear, O house of the king, for judgment is towards you, because you have been a snare on Mizpah, and a net spread upon Tabor. You know, Mizpah was the place where they would gather for battle in Ephraim, and Tabor was Mount Tabor. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou commits whoredom, and Israel is defiled. They will not frame their doings to turn to their God, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. And the pride of Israel does testify to his face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall fall with them. And as you know, in 721 BC, uh, Israel was taken away captive, and in 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed and taken captive into Babylon. But Jerusalem was returned for David's sake, or for the sake of Jesus Christ being born that's David's the house of David okay now and he goes on and Jews and and they shall go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord but they shall not find him he has withdrawn himself from them they have dealt treacherously against the Lord for they have begotten strange children now shall a month devour them with their portions. Blow you the cornet in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Aven, after thee, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which shall surely be. The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound, Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandment. Therefore, I will be to Ephraim as a moth and to the house of Judah as rottenness. And when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian and sent to King Jerob Yet could not he heal you, nor cure you of your wound? For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away, and I will take away, and none shall rescue him. And I will go and return to my place, till they acknowledge their offense, and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. So I read that chapter because it ties in very well Ephraim with Israel. And it doesn't let Judah off the hook either. And uh, there's also Protestants. Um, they're not out of the woods either. Um, it's like... Jehoshaphat was best friends with Ahab and Jezebel. Even though Jehoshaphat was following the ways of the Lord, his best friends were the enemies of God. They were bringing in Baal worship and idolatry into Israel. And because of his friendship and their children, the next generations, they had all this problem. They almost wiped out the house of David. Um, so it's the same with the Protestants. They're like, oh, we're all one family. We can all be one family with the Jews, 
even though the Jews don't believe in Jesus, with the Catholics, even though they have basically Baal worship with Jesus' name on it, the Protestants are wonderful friends with them. It's all for love and humanity. Well, I don't think God sees it that way because he didn't see it that way in ancient times. And he says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. What makes modern Christians any better than ancient Semites? And, you know, I'm not calling for violence or anything like that against anybody. But we, in this day and age, we live in a time of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and freedom of conscience. And we are in a level playing field where I can call out wrongs that I see. And I, and I will call them out. And I'm not calling for violence. I'm, what is it? Plead with your mother. I'm pleading with the mother. I'm calling it out that this is not God's way. So, that's all. I'm not calling for anything else. I'm calling for people to wake up and realize that, you know, you have to actually understand who God is if you're going to worship God. Because there's a lot of organizations out there that are false.